ways to remind us that you are still here and that you are with us and you are going with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 It's so tempting to segue over to the to Moses and the children of Israel and and all that they went through and man go into the promised land all of these things just I'm like wow do we realize what we are about to embark upon do we realize that we're about to make history wow but the good thing is we're not going to be anybody to read our history books so we're going to be in heaven rejoicing and this is going to be this is all going to be gone what I what I want to share with you for our last session I want to I want to talk a little bit more about prayer and fast fasting because I was telling a gentleman last night I don't really remember who it was but I said, I just looked at him and I said fasting changed my life I said it changed my life so much that I know that I wouldn't be where I am today and I certainly wouldn't be I would probably wouldn't be an Adventist and I would not be in this church for this weekend so it transformed my life, and I know that the pastor has alluded to a couple of things already, but, you know, I remember, I remember the very first day that I fasted. I don't know if you can remember your first day. If you can, just take a minute and think about it, your first day that you ever fasted. Maybe you can't. Maybe it's been so long ago, but it's super memorable for me because, one, I was a little reluctant. And I really didn't know what I was getting into. You know, we're just not eager to do things we don't really understand completely. There's that fear factor. And so <clears throat> I remember driving to work 30 miles to the hospital. And I, I got in my car. And the day before, I had purposely uh, altered my food choices, kind of like we're doing this weekend. Fruits, nuts, water, very simple. I, I didn't have any, you know, heavy foods, greasy, spicy, nothing like that. Just very simple the day before, 24 hours going into my three-day fast. I don't know why the number three was so significant. I'll have to talk to Jesus about that later. But he impressed me to, to fast for three days. And he impressed me personally to fast from food. But I know I don't have to say it, but there's too many things that you can fast from if you are unable to fast from food. We live in a world of just too many distractions. Social media is one of them. And clearly, if I had had social media in that day, that would have, been one, that would, that would have accompanied my food fast, most likely. But I'm driving to work that first day, and I'm thinking, oh, I get in the car, and my radio was on. And it wasn't playing anything bad in and of itself. But it wasn't really playing um, character building lyrics. Does that make sense what I'm saying to you? And I thought, hmm. So I turned off the radio and I thought, I, I'm about to do something so serious. I'm about to do this thing called fasting. I don't know what I'm doing. I should probably just turn that radio off and just talk to God on the way to work. So I just imagined Jesus in the car with me riding to work. And the ride went super fast. I mean, I just poured my heart out to him, and I got to work, went to the locker room, and went into the lounge, and I had totally failed to remember that in that um, lounge was a platter every day, without fail, a platter of, <laughs> yeah, you know, like donuts and bear claws and jelly-filled things, all of those things, and bagels and cream cheese and all that stuff. And I thought, oh, this is going to be horrible, <laughs> you know. And so I walked out of there really fast, went and got my Bible, and found a quiet spot. I'd got my operating room all ready, and I just sat there. Now, if I had a, a picture, I would have loved to, I, I wish I'd have thought to throw some visuals up for you guys of some before and afters. Oh, my goodness. But if I had a picture of a, just use your imagination, a plate. If we had a plate right now and it's empty, there's nothing on that plate, no food, nothing, just blank slate. And on each side of that plate, there's a fork and a knife. 
this is how I approached fasting, except on the plate where there normally is food, picture your Bible laying in the plate. Have you got it? You've got a plate, you've got a Bible laying in the plate, and a fork and a knife. And yes, my stomach grumbled and growled that first day really bad. It was embarrassing. I didn't tell anyone I was fasting. No one knew. So what I had to do is I had to eat the Word of God. I couldn't read the Bible while I was in the operating room, but as soon as I got in between cases, a break, lunch, eating God's Word. Every time my tummy growled and I couldn't read, because I mean, I, like I said, I didn't even have the Bible. I didn't even have like, I mean, I'm getting old, but I didn't have the Bible on my phone any of that because I just had like a little bitty like weird phone, but um, cheap phone I call it. Um, <laughs> so I had to do everything that I could, and so when my stomach growled and I couldn't physically read, I prayed. Every time my stomach growled. Now. Without doubt, that first day was horrible to me. I mean, it was... <laughs> but the second day I fasted, it was amazing. I thought, hmm, I've read the scripture before, but now it, it, it's speaking a little louder to me. It's a little bit more clear to me. And I thought, wow, there's, the cobwebs are clearing from my brain. And that was only 24 hours into... I fast. So the second day was remarkable. The third day, I literally felt like the hair was standing up on my arms. I was just so in tune to God. I didn't even think about food. Now, if you know me, and Gail knows me, well, I love food. <laughs> All kinds of food. I told her yesterday, she said, do you, uh, you have any, no, no, Gail, no, I, I have no Nothing. I, I like all food. I have no allergies. I have no pickiness. I'll eat whatever. And so for me to fast from food, I do not think was an accident. Um, like I said, that's what God impressed me to do. But on that third day, I am reading. I am praying. I am seeing God do something remarkable, remember, in me. Nothing in my husband at this point. This is me that's changing. And I remember driving home that day and just thinking about all that, that God could be doing, what could be happening, and experiencing this just washing over of God. And I remembered those words again from my mom, that she felt closer to God when she fasted. And I knew right then it was a connection I was like, I know what she means now. And I did without food, and I cried a lot just like my mom. But I felt closer to God. Amen. And so that's what it did for me. Um, but I want to draw your attention. It uh, wouldn't be worth my weight and salt if I did not draw your attention to Mark 9, 29, as Pastor Mercado has already alluded to. But it's very important that we look at Mark 9, 29, because... <clears throat> Um, hang on, I lost my glasses, but I didn't lose my glasses. I just don't have them, but I'm just, let me fumble around a second here. Okay. In Mark 9, 29, um, if we were to read all verses, there's clearly, um, there's an unclean spirit. And, and the, the disciples can't rebuke the spirit. And I'll just go ahead and pick up in verse 28. It said, when he came come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, asked Jesus privately, why, why can we not do this? Why can we not cast out this unclean spirit? And in verse 29, he says to them, this kind can come out by nothing but, but by prayer and fasting. What kind of thing was he talking about? I don't want you to answer out loud, but... What kind of thing was he talking about? Was, was the demon so big and so bad? Hey, I can't face it. I can't, the disciples can't handle this one. This demon's way too big. Was that the kind of thing he was possibly talking about? I don't think so. I'm not a scholar by any means. But this is what I believe. And I brought it out in the sermon this morning. I believe what was so big 
and what was so bad was not the demon. Thank you, sir. Lack of faith. Unbelief. The disciples, they didn't, they didn't really think they could do it. And so this is why I bring this up, because prayer and fasting, this is what it did for me. And it'll do, it should do this for everyone, because I believe this is the spiritual application we're looking at. I had to pray and fast until I believed that God was going to do what he said he would do. And when that happened, that collision happened in my heart, it was unstoppable. I'm going to tell you what happened. The very first day of my three-day, the, the ending of the first three-day fast, let me get that clear. So on the third day, I'm coming home. I'm just basking all this. This won't be a big deal to you, but it was a huge deal to me. Um, remember, my husband drank every day. 15 beer, and in addition to whatever you want, but the 15 beer was up, you know, non-negotiable. That happened every day. I walked in from work, and he kept a 30-pack. There would be 15 beer on the top and 15 on the bottom, separated by this little cardboard thing. And so I knew on a daily basis, I almost always came home at the same time, I almost always could tell you about how many beer cans would be gone out of the case, okay? I remember, just as if it were yesterday, walking up the stairs into my little house there and um, looking to the left where the case of beer always would sit and going, hmm, there's a few more cans in there than usual this time of day. I walked up the step toward the, looked toward the trash can and I went, hmm, not as many cans in there. I mean. More there, less there. I mean, it's, you know, two plus two is, you know, four, no matter how you look at it. I mean, I was like, there's something's going on. And I knew right then, did my fasting cause that? I can't say that it did or didn't. That's not what it was about. But I serve a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I ask or think. And so I don't know what he was doing in the heart of my husband. I only knew what he was doing in my heart. But because he loves me so much, he says, I got this. And he gives us little surprises along the way to increase our faith muscles. So you better know that at the end of that three days, my spiritual faith muscles were starting to get a little pumped. I mean, I would love to be able to go to the gym and walk out in one day and get, like, completely toned, trimmed up, perfect in one day. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> it doesn't. She said, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> you know, we know that God can do what he wants when he wants on his time schedule. But he needed to do something for me, with me, through me, that would change and alter my course of life forever. And that he did. And every single time I fasted, now when I would finish the three days, the following 24 hours, I went back to simple foods again. I didn't jump right back into, you know, eating whatever I wanted. Kept it simple. So going in, coming out of the fast, I kept it simple just to keep my system not going crazy or anything. And I would continue my studies every day. I kept on doing everything I was doing. And it would go on several weeks. And I would hear the Lord say, it's time again to fast. And I would buckle down and get ready for the journey. And every single time I went through a three-day fast, God gave me those special little surprises. I have a list of them. My husband, one evening, he, he and his buddy, they, it was like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd actually started preparing dinner. We were going to have an early dinner. And he and his friend said, hey, we're going to go up the road and go get a pack of cigarettes. We'll be back in 30 minutes. Well, that 30 minutes turned into 12 hours, and they came in at 3 a.m. And dinner had already been cleared, kids had already been put to bed, dad didn't come home that evening. That was a pretty regular routine at our home. 
And uh, he came in at 3 a.m. And I had, in the past, <laughs> got up and gave him a piece of my mind and thought about, you know, an iron skillet over their head a few times. But anyway, I remember waking up and hearing them come in so loud, so boisterous, so like, I was like, I can't believe this, Lord. And I got up and I walked down the hall and I just looked at them and boy, they like, well, oh, she's up, <laughs> you know. And I says, what would you like to eat? And they just looked at each other. How many of you have seen The War Room? Mm -hmm. They might have thought I was about to poison them, but I didn't. And um, I cooked them food. I went to bed. And this was 3 a.m. And because we had a farm, my husband, like, he, like, crashed for a few hours. And then, you know, he had to be back up by 7 or 8 to go down to the farm and do the stuff. And... I was in the living room or in the kitchen and he walked through and I heard his steps, but I didn't turn to look at him, but I heard his footsteps, you know, stop. And I just waited because I did not know what he was going to say. You never knew what was going to come out of his mouth. He said, why did you do that last night? Why were you so kind to us? Him and his buddy. I took a deep breath and I said, well, it wasn't really me. It was Jesus. I said, I didn't have it in me. I said, but that's what Jesus told me to do. I said, I've been spending a lot of time with him and he's changing my life. And he said, I can tell. I like it, he said. And I, I thought, where do we go from here? And I would love to tell you everything got smooth and wonderful from there on out, but there were some really hard times after that. 911, we all remember where we were when the Twin Towers collapsed. That night before 911, my husband had pulled one of the worst stunts in our entire life. He had gotten so high. And thank you. And I normally, when he was like that, never would approach him. I would just let him do his thing. And, you know, but for some reason that night he came in, I just, I let him have it that night. I was like, I gotta, I just can't handle this, you know. I didn't really let him have it. I just was up and wanted to ask him why he was continuing to do this, you know. And we got in one of the worst fights we've ever been in in our entire life. And it, it got really bad. And uh, I went to the other bedroom and went to bed. And I called in sick the next morning for work. I didn't go to work. And when I got up, I thought, it's really quiet in the house when he's... You know, he wasn't in the bedroom, and I walked down. Um, I, actually, I, the phone rang as I was looking for him, and it was his ex-wife because they had something going on with the boys that day. And she, I answered the phone, and she said, "What are you? What are you? Are, what are you doing home?" I said, "I'm not feeling well." And she said, "Well, you need to turn on the TV." She said, "The world is coming to an end." <laughs> And I thought, you have no idea. And I went and turned on the TV and saw what was happening, and I immediately left out to go outside to look for him. And I found him. And he'll tell you to this day, he saw me, but he knew that there was a different look on my face than normal. It wasn't a look like, I want to fight, you know. It was a look of just crazy. And we came in and we sat and we watched that all day long on TV over and over and we both sat there and we didn't speak a word to each other we just sat there and watched it and I remember feeling so guilty because my heart was aching for our country and the injustices that were being done but my heart was aching for my own marriage and I wasn't sure I was so upset and not long after that 
4th of July came around and another explosive blow up happened with us to the point that my parents came. There was a lot of fight, fighting. My dad almost killed him. It was horrible. And um, I ran away from our home, literally ran away from our home and ran down the road. It was pouring down rain. And there was a church with a little light on, a little Methodist church. And I literally ran to the door and turned the door handle. This was in the middle of the night and the door was open. And I ran into the church and there was a stained glass and the light was just, there was a light outside that church on that stained glass and it illuminated the sanctuary. And I laid there sobbing for hours, crying out to the Lord. And when I came home, he was his worst, worst words I'd ever seen him. And he said, um, he said, I'm messed up, aren't I? I said, you are really messed up. I said, we cannot continue on like this. We, something has to change. And, and things really did begin to change after that. And as you well know, um, I'm fasting and praying before we, ever, before we ever started studying with Adventists. God was working on my heart way ahead of when Dave came on the scene. So that was in July, 4th of July, that was in 2003, and we started the Bible studies in November of 03. So nothing, I'm telling you all this for a reason, nothing happened for us overnight. I didn't pray, and then everything would be okay. God was developing my faith muscles, little by little. Did I have struggles and bad days? Of course I did. You don't live in that kind of environment and have rosy days all the time. There was reprieve, but most of it was just miserable. And so I'm telling you, I, don't, I'm, I want to first of all tell you that this right here is Gideon's army. Right here. Look at each other. This is Gideon's army. You are here and you are wanting everything that God has to give you. Take it. Don't leave it on the table. God is up to something. I want to be a part of it and... I'm going to invite Gail to start making her way up here because we are going to have an anointing service. And I don't want to get into the details of that. I'm going to let Gail do that. But God has paid the price for you. Receive his blessing. Don't walk out of here today leaving anything on the table. Give it all to him. Take all, all that he has to offer you right here today. It's going to change your life, and you'll never be the same. You know, sometimes when we say anointing, <clears throat> uh, people might run or may think that anointing is for somebody that's in the hospital dying because that's traditionally how we've done anointing. But I think we've misread what the scriptures teaches about anointing. Um, and I, I want to use this short story because it kind of ties in with what Cynthia's been talking about. This is in John 5. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida which is the house of mercy, by the way, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of, now I want you to hear this, disabled people used to lie. Do you hear that word, disabled? The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Guess who that is? That's us. That's us. We're sick. We're sick with sin. And here, here we are, you know. They were all laying around there, trying, hoping that this pool, remember the story, oh, an angel's going to come and stir it up because she said it was work. Things didn't just happen magically. There was work involved. They wanted magic here, didn't they? They wanted instantaneous healing. Doesn't always come, does it? But the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And then I want you to hear this. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And later, it's like 
um, in Acts, there's, um, is it John and Peter that heal the, you know, the, the other, yeah, <laughs> cripple. Um, and it says that he was crippled from birth. You know what that means? That he, in here, he was crippled from birth. That's how he saw himself. And it says, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he was for 38 years. This is in here, not just that he couldn't walk, but here he was crippled. And he asked him, this is Jesus, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? So that's the question right now for all of us. I have found that anointing is a powerful way to call on God. Not just fasting and prayer, but anointing. It means that I am really serious, and I am going to come to you with whatever it is. Did you know that kings were anointed, priests were anointed? Did you know that bread was anointed in the holy place? Or in the most, yeah, the holy place, yes, the bread um, the temple, the whole tabernacle was anointed. Garments, Aaron's garments were anointed. The altar was anointed. Even uh, Jesus was anointed. Isaiah, we, we have to read it just real quick here. Isaiah 61, verse 1, it'll be very familiar to you. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has what? anointed me. And did you know that the name Christ means what? Messiah and the anointed one. Many theologians believe that the moment that Jesus went to heaven and was surrounded by all of heaven's hosts after the cross and the resurrection, that he was anointed again and that the oil that was poured over Jesus came down from heaven and fell on the upper room and filled those there. The question is, do you want to get well? Guess who anointed Jesus again before he died? Who did? Who was the last person to anoint him? It was Mary. And the sweet incense, Ellen White alludes to this, that that smell, that aroma, because it was a whole box. Anybody buy any perfume from Paris that's pure, anything pure? Because you know it says pure nard, nard. That means there's nothing added, no additives, pure. I, I, I just think when she opened that up, must have knocked them all over. <laughs> I'm very sensitive to smell. I smell everything. So I would have just been going, you know, but... Um, and that she used that to anoint his feet and his head. And Ellen White alludes to the fact that when he hung on the cross, that sweet fragrance lingered. And he knew that somebody understood. I think Mary knew, because he said, she's prepared me for my burial. Do you want? to get well. In Acts 10, it says, this is Peter, you know what has happened through, throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. That same anointing can be ours. James 5, that's the, the uh, scripture that we use to anoint. But I want you to read it with a little different eyes because some we, again, kind of just lean towards I'm sick, you need to be healed. But it starts the, the, the chapter, verse 13, chapter 5, verse 13 of James, starts this way. Is any of you in trouble? Does anybody have any trouble today? I will tell you, we have something in our family we need a miracle for. My in-laws, 91 and 92, have had their house sold out from underneath them that they lived in in 53 years. 
And I mean, I cannot tell you all of the, it's a Job experience. They both broke their hips this summer simultaneously. I mean, there's just one thing after another that has happened. And they need a miracle. They're in trouble. Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? <laughs> you can be anointed and be happy. <laughs> And then it says, let him sing songs of praise. We've been doing that, right? If any of you are sick, he should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in what? Faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Because the prayer of a righteous man or woman does what? It's powerful and effective. This is the NIV. I like that, don't you? I like avail, but I like powerful. Powered, yeah, powered by prayer. Powerful and effective. Being anointed is not just for somebody who's in a hospital bed. Because what God wants to do is to change us, just like he changed Cynthia. I love this from Desire of Ages. She says, someday a renovated... Did anybody watch HGTV when they renovate houses? <laughs> okay. <laughs> just a renovated race shall walk with him in white. It just makes me weep almost. I want to be renovated. So it doesn't matter if you're discouraged, if you're heartbroken, if you're sad, if you don't have enough money, if you're alone, if you're hurting, if you're angry, if you're jealous, if you're struggling with sin, you can come and be anointed. And here's what I love this example um, of the, the butterfly, you know, the caterpillar and the butterfly. Listen to what happens with metamorphosis. It says metamorphosis is a radical change in form and function. Many animals go through the process, but most of all, we know about caterpillars and butterflies. Yet scientists are only beginning to grasp the miracle of what goes on in a chrysalis. New research shows that the insect's makeover is a mix of destruction. Did you hear that? Destruction of the old ways of being and thinking, combined with brand new ways of being and thinking. The article notes that certain cells die and body parts atrophy. Meanwhile, other cells in place since birth rapidly expand. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Do you see what God wants to do for us? It says that the adult emerges completely remodeled, renovated, capable of flight, and possessing a completely rewired brain. That's what anointing can do for us. That's what God wants to do for us here and for your church. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what is going on in your life right now. He's inviting you to come. Be anointed with that oil. It's not magic. And it doesn't guarantee anything's going to happen overnight. It may be some hard work behind it. But he's asking us to come. And before we come, we have to have a cleansed heart. And in that, in a bit, we're going to be doing um, the communion service and I want you to think about something in conjunction with anointing and the communion service. That the disciples would have never, ever been able to receive those flames of fire in the second upper room. You know, there's two upper rooms. If they hadn't been in the first upper room. They had to go through the first upper room where their feet were washed the bread was broken, and the wine was poured and drank. 
So I'm going to take one moment before we gather the elders, and this is how we're going to do this. I'm going to ask the elders to come up front, and they're going to have some little vials of oil. And do we have paper towel? Okay, we have some paper towel. And um, then what we're going to do, I'm going to ask you all to, we're going to have a moment of prayer um, because we got to have our hearts right, every one of us. Doesn't matter if we're up here as an elder, doesn't matter if we're coming up. <laughs> we want our hearts right because it's the prayer of the righteous. And by the way, remember, it's not our righteousness, is it? Whose is it? Who are we covered by today? The blood of Jesus, it's his righteousness. He's the righteous branch. Remember that? He's the righteous branch. So if it doesn't matter what we've done, who we are, we can in this moment be righteous and pray as a righteous man or woman. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Hallelujah. That's right. And so I'm going to have the elders lined up here. And then you can come forward and just kind of line up behind them. And they're just going to ask you, what do you want to be anointed for today? And by the way, you can be anointed for somebody else. I have done anointings with that. I just, I have to share this. Um, it was about a month and a half ago. Had a friend's young uh, son. Actually, it wasn't. It was in November. Um, who had a brain bleed. Young. He's only in his early 30s. And he was at Vanderbilt, and they didn't know. They had to shave his head. They had to go in to his brain, do surgery to clean it out. Um, I mean, this was, this was scary. And his mother said, Gail, can you come down and anoint him? I don't know if you are aware of this, but you know when somebody has brain surgery, the result is you usually have seizures. And unfortunately, this young man had so many seizures, and they couldn't stop them. They, they kept trying everything and everything. And... They said, Gail, let's go back, let's go back. So it was his mother, myself, and sister that were the only ones that could be in there. While Sean was seizing, his body was shaking, I anointed him. I've never had that experience before. But I want you to know something really, really amazing. I said, Sean, do you know what I'm doing? Do you know what this is? Do you know what this means? I'm anointing you. And his left arm was uh, from, the, from the stroke he'd had. He couldn't move his left arm. But his right thumb went up in the middle of a seizure. He knew what we were doing. He knew. And do you know that Sean is home? He is still recuperating, but that man is doing so great. It's a miracle. They didn't even know if he was actually going to survive. So we're going to take just a couple moments, and I want you to personally pray, and I want you to ask for a pure heart and for Christ's righteousness right now. Thank you. Father in heaven, our list is long if we were to write down all of the offenses that we have done against you, and yet you don't hold them there. You throw them away as far as the east is from the west, which as far as I can figure out, there is no, it's gone. <laughs> there is no east to west all the way around the world. You can't figure that out, Lord, it's gone into the depths of the sea. You've told us that you are faithful in cleansing us. Cleansing is just such a beautiful thing. Cleansing us from all unrighteousness. So before we pray, as the elders and pastors gather here, we ask, Lord, that you will cleanse us and that our prayers will not be anything on our own, but will be covered by the righteousness and the blood of Jesus. 
and that you will anoint us all with the Holy Spirit. That question, do you want to be well? And Lord, we're just saying yes, yes. So the invitation is to come. And we ask this in Jesus' precious and redeeming name. Amen. Amen.